Hi, beautiful people. We are here live for the Intimate Health Yoga Book Club. We're talking about my favorite book, Come As You Are, and we're going to discuss part three. So hopefully you checked out the survey. Hopefully you filled something in. Um, if not, I hope you enjoy this recap of part three. So let's start from the top with the important things that we discussed. Um, so I don't know, I think part three for myself was super eye-opening for how I am in my own body and in my relationship. So let's just jump right in. First topic is arousal non-concordance. So I've got all my tabs here. Arousal non-concordance is the idea that genital response doesn't necessarily match a person's experience of arousal, and it runs contrary to the standard narrative about sex, obviously, right? So um, the biggest um, example of this is, oh, I'm so wet, doesn't necessarily mean that you are turned on or you're into it, right? Um, so I pulled our people from the book club and i asked have you experienced arousal non-concordance where your genital response doesn't necessarily match your experience of arousal and the answers are interesting because we've got some people that said yes that happens to me often we have some people that said i think but it wasn't really clear if this was happening and then some people said it happens to me once in a while not one person said, nope, never happened to me. So this happens, it's normal, it's natural, and I'm sure that we've all experienced this at one time in our lives or the other. Um, I loved that she started to talk about the difference between males and females because it makes a lot of sense. Um, let's look at this chart, right? This is crazy. I'm going to read this. Um, so there's a 50% overlap between what a male's genital response, oh, I'm sorry, what a male's genitals respond to as sexually relevant and what his brain responds to as sexually appealing. And there's about a 10% overlap between what a female's genitals respond to as sexually relevant and what her brain responds to as sexually appealing. Men's genitals are relatively specific in what they respond to, and so are their brains. But a woman's genitals are relatively genital, general, general and genitals. A woman's genitals are relatively general in what they respond to, while their brains are much more sensitive to context. Note that a stimulus can be relevant without appealing. So what does that mean? right? Like our brains, you can recognize something as that is sexually relevant. This means sex. Like they talked about bonobo chimps having sex, right? It might not necessarily be the sexiest thing you've seen, but your genitals may respond saying, oh yes, this is sexually relevant. Now I'm wet. Um, so I think that's fascinating that there's no predictive relationship between how aroused a woman feels and how much her genitals respond, which means that we need to communicate with each other, especially when it comes to people with pussies. So um, in my question, there's a 10% overlap, be, um, which means there's no predictive relationship between how aroused a woman feels and how much her genitals respond. It's statistically insignificant. We can't rely on fluids or the genitals alone to tell us how much a woman or a man is enjoying themselves. This means we have to communicate more. How does this resonate with you? Does this make sense from your experiences? And I ask people to comment freely. And a few of my favorite responses, some pretty insightful responses. One, yes, I'm very slippery and wet during the fertile days of my cycle, and this is happening all day, even if I'm not aroused, right? That has nothing to do with being aroused. That is just your hormones and your body functioning well. So yes, when you're wet, it might not mean that you're aroused. I love that. Thank you for sharing. 
Another comment, yes, communication is really key here. I think partners assume that when you're wet, you're ready and letting them know that that's not the case is important, right? So they're like, mm, she's wet, okay, let's do this. But mentally it's like, no, 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 I need a lot more. Um, and then she adds, it's hard when society tells us one thing, but reality is totally different. Girl, I feel you, right? It's like, if you're wet, it's time. Well, no, ask me, don't just ask my pussy. Another comment, yes, it helps to know that my body is not working against me. I'm sorry, she actually said, yes, it helps to know that my body is working against me. <laughs> Even if my genitals aren't responding, I can still want sexy time. That's amazing. This has shifted for me throughout the years as I've gained confidence with myself and sexual partners, but it was really supportive to read and learn about. That's amazing, right? So it's, it's like, yes, your genitals aren't responding the way that you would like them to or the way society tells you that they should, but you still deserve amazing intimacy and sex in the way that you want it. So, so important to speak up. Speak up, speak up, speak up. Listen to my words, not my vagina. Thank you. I love this. <laughs> Question three, non-concordance in other emotions. So I thought this was really fascinating because this personally resonated with me on a whole other level in the past couple of months. And this is a big reason of why I wasn't actually doing the book club and I wasn't active on Instagram. So you guys know it before anyone else does. Um, let me read a little bit about emotional non-concordance. So what this research suggests, she goes through an entire research study um, on page 199 to 200. But what this research suggests is that a woman's emotional experience is more likely to line up with her facial expression and her vocal inflection, while a man's emotional experience is more likely to line up with his heart rate and blood flow. Whether or not there's a gender difference, it's fair to say that what you experience as your emotional life doesn't necessarily line up neatly with what your brain and body are doing. It doesn't make you a liar. It doesn't make you crazy. And it doesn't mean you're in denial. It just means that you're being a human. Sorry, that you're a human being or being a human whose emotional and motivational responses may be more complex than any other species. And men and women experience non-concordance differently in those emotions. It's not a sex thing. It's a human thing. I love this. So I asked the readers, think of a time where you emo your emotional life wasn't necessarily lining up with what your brain and body are doing. Can you share this experience? How does this knowledge help you better understand and accept your humanness? So personally, huge wake-up call. Um, actually one person did say, I'm not sure. One person said, when I'm feeling really sad or emotional about something, it can affect how I'm really feeling about the sex. Even if I do orgasm, it might just not be that great. True. Right. So you can have an orgasm, but underlying you're sad just because you have an orgasm. Does that mean that your sadness is cured? No, absolutely not. That just means you're human with a bunch of emotions and then a genital response. Um, so personally, I experienced a really crazy traumatic event um, early in February. So I was driving my car through a neighborhood and a man who was most likely homeless and on drugs ran towards my car with a weapon. And whew, honestly, like bringing it up, I start to breathe like a little bit shallower so I have to remind myself to breathe um, I called the police they're looking for him honestly it was such a random incident and it was probably just me being there at the wrong time um, but the biggest thing was I could rationally explain like yes this was someone who was obviously having a troubled day but in that moment the fear was so consuming and that survival mode of like i need to get out of here um and speeding off stayed in my body 
and it's still in my body. And I know this is a lot of work that I have to take on to release this. So emotionally, my body was so tense, you guys. Like I couldn't breathe. I could not take a deep breath for three days. Like straight up, couldn't do it. I tried. Really the only thing that helped and got me through this was yoga and meditation and breath work. Like it works, right? So it helps me. I'm still working on it, still talking to therapists, still, you know, just trying to release this tension. But it was such a crazy example of rationally, I'm okay. And I can understand that crazy shit happens um, and we can't really explain it. But physically, I was holding on to that so tight, that fear, right? So I think non-concordance in emotions was huge. And if anyone has experienced trauma, they understand that those feelings can stay in the body for a long time. And I feel you, and I'm here for you. <sighs> Number four, we talked about about lubrication errors. Um, so I really liked that she was talking about lubrication errors because I think this is something that's super pervasive in our society because um, we talk about being wet a lot. And I actually have so many women at my retreats and workshops that say like, oh, I don't need lube because I'm wet and I have no problem with that. And most of the time, I just want to say, like, it's it's not about you being able to experience moisture down there. It's more about adding to the experience, right? So adding lube to any sexual experience, like literally any sexual experience just makes it better. And whatever lube that you prefer works. I like coconut oil. Some people think it's not good for them and it screws up the pH of their vagina. Don't use it. Um, there's all kinds of water-based lubes, silicone-based lubes. Use whatever works for your toy. Um, and you can read on your toy's description of what's the best lube. But use it. And don't think that it's a bad thing that you're using lube. Just think that you're enhancing your experience. Um, but I asked our readers, what are the lubrication errors from the most shocking to... Eh, I kind of figured. And it turns out it kind of lines up exactly with how they're presented. So the number one most like, this is shocking, error is genital response equals turned on. So a great example is penis owners wake up with erections because of nocturnal penile tumescence and it happens during REM sleep. So fascinating. Um, that this is a natural normal thing and it's not because they're aroused it doesn't necessarily necessarily mean that they're dreaming of something that is sexually stimulating or arousing um and i'm sure that vagina owners can attest to this too because i sure have felt um i call it thumping um, that's like a fun term for when you feel blood rushing to the erectile tissue in the genitals, you can actually feel like blood pulsing to the area. Um, so if you've got a vagina and you know what, or you felt thumping, let me know because it's a thing. Um, but sometimes I'll feel that at times when I'm really not trying to be aroused. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm feeling things. Um, but I don't necessarily like need to be turned on right now. Um, so that happens, like penis owners, vagina owners, it happens. And then the opposite of I'm super turned on, but I'm not wet. And that's, I don't know, the time of day, the hydration, like how hydrated you are, all these things affect your genital response. And it's not necessarily whether or not you're aroused. Um, <clears throat> so lubrication error number two was the second most shocking. Genital response must mean that the person is enjoying it. We metaphorize our bodies and use descriptions of our physiology to stand in for descriptions of our states of mind. I'm so wet and I'm so hard are intended to say I'm into this. This is so deeply entrenched in our culture, you guys. Like these phrases are um they're in just like i don't know i'm american i'm a girl um 
this is so common. And as a sex educator, we say it all the time. Like, oh, you're getting wet or you're really hard because you're turned on. Um, and it's, I don't want to say it's a bad thing to say um, because it is difficult to separate once we have these social norms and these phrases that are meant to mean something. Um, but just deep down, know that there's more to it. It's not just I'm wet. It's not just I'm hard. It's I'm into this and I want this. So just know that for yourself moving forward. And then you can kind of chuckle when you hear someone say like, I'm wet or I'm hard when they mean I'm really into this and I'm sexually aroused. <laughs> um, lubrication error number three is non-concordance is a problem. It's not. You're normal. You're a human. The problem is context sensitivity hitting the brakes. Increasing sensitivity to context, which is external circumstances and internal brain state, rather than to genital response is what makes the difference. So on page 213, she gets into this a little bit more. Context sensitivity causes both the low desire and the non-concordance. Non-concordance is not the problem. Context hitting the brakes is the problem. So it's fun context, which is the external circumstances. So what you're doing, where you are, and your internal brain state. Like I'm relaxed and I'm into this. That's what matters. That is what is going to hit the brakes. So it's fundamental to most women's sexual well-being. Increasing sex, so what you need to do um, is increase your sensitivity to context rather than to genital response. And that's what makes the difference. Context is the crux and the key. Context is the cause. So when you are trying to combat this lubrication error, thinking that non-concordance is a problem, think what am I like what context am I becoming sexually aroused in what context do I want to become sexually aroused in and then what internal brain state do I know that I need to be in to have the best experience so these are all personal it's different for everyone but it's so important that you really try to discover this for yourself <sighs> medicating away the breaks Ooh, I love this one um, because this is, as I read, this is an excellent example of medical model thinking, right? Since it pays attention to the biology and even the psychology, but ignores relationship and social factors. Um, I have my master's in public health, and this was the biggest thing right? It's you can't look at a population and say they're healthy because they have um, access to healthcare and um, access to healthcare, right? No, we have to look at the whole population. What are their cultural norms? What are the social norms of this population? Is it a social norm to go out for a run? Or is it a social norm to sit inside and watch TV? That's what is going to make a bigger difference rather than access to healthcare, or access to medication, right? It's the social norms and the, the psychology of what we're doing as a whole. Um, so getting back to this, in other words, this medical model um, thinking ignores women's actual lives. Like straight up, it just focuses on like one thing. Um, you can't medically treat a whole life or a relationship. So why bother taking them into account when you're trying to figure out how to treat sexual problems? You need to. <laughs> we don't need to reduce non-concordance. We need to improve the context, external circumstances and internal states such as stress, attachment, self-criticism and disgust. And it does not take a pill to do that. So what I wrote for the question is, you simply cannot medicate away sexual breaks. Arousal medication may work on biology, right? It sends blood to the genitals, but it ignores relationship and social factors. We don't need to reduce non-concordance. We need to improve the context. Um, it doesn't take a pill to do that. If you did have a magical pill that did address all of the context, what are a few major factors that this pill would need to address? So from our readers, I like this question because I think it's fun. 
Um, okay, ready? So the magical pill would need to address stress about money, body image is issues, stress about problems with our kids or our extended family, family members. Shit, I wish that there is a pill that could take care of all of that because that would really help every relationship, I think, in the world. Um, this pill would address stressing and overthinking about how things are supposed to be. That's big. With all these things added, with these things added things, it interferes with my context. Yes. Yes, definitely. All these things added into the context can just throw off the whole scene, right? You're thinking about overthinking about how it should be and how it's supposed to be. It takes you away from the present moment, which is where the context lies. Um, this pill would also address stress, body positivity, and confidence. I wish there was a magic pill for body positivity and confidence. Um, I would probably be out of a job, actually, if there was a magic pill for this, because all of this stuff is so dependent on each person and how they feel about themselves. So you guys, one day we'll be able to create these little pills. But in the meantime, we've got yoga, we've got meditation, we've got different ways, different methods to try, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> Next topic is sexual desire. I love this. Sexual desire is not a drive. It's not a drive. I love that. Like, period. We're done. Um, I'm going to read this portion because I think it's very important. The standard narrative of sexual desire is that it just appears. You're sitting at lunch or walking down the street. Maybe you see a sexy person or think a sexy thought and pow, you're saying to yourself, I would like some sex. This is how it works for maybe 75% of men and 15% of women. And this is spontaneous desire, right? So that's one mode of desire. Then some people find that they may begin to want sex only after sexy things are already happening. And they're normal. They don't have low desire. They don't suffer from any ailment. They don't need they don't long to initiate, but they feel like they're not allowed to. Their bodies just need some more compelling reason than that's an attractive person right there to want sex. They are sexually satisfied and in healthy relationships, which means that the lack of spontaneous desire for sex is not in itself dysfunctional or problematic. Let me repeat. Responsive desire, which is this, responsive desire, is normal and healthy. And it's how roughly 5% of men and 30% of women experience desire. You'll notice that this leaves about half of women and about one in five men unaccounted for. These folks are, these are folks whose desire style is probably context dependent and they're normal too. So sex is a motive incentive motivation system that's the biggest thing here it's not a drive um and how she explains it is a drive is something innate within us to survive it's pushed by an unpleasant internal state which ends when you return to baseline so one drive is i'm hungry i eat and then i return to baseline great the other one uh, the difference is incentive. Incentive is to thrive. It's pulled by an attractive external stimulus, the incentive, and then it ends when you've obtained the incentive, which is sex, right? So you want this, you desire it, you get it, you feel good, you feel amazing. It's not that you return back to normal, back to baseline with hunger, it's like you're accelerated with this. And I love that. My yogi heart loves this. Um, so I ask, desire emerges when arousal crosses a person's individual threshold. It's not a drive. It doesn't have anything to do with survival. Spontaneous desire is privileged in our culture, and it's easy to feel disempowered if it's not your primary style. But Sex is an incentive motivation system. Responsive desire is normal and healthy. How does this make you feel about yourself or your partner? So I really love the responses from this because it's important. Like, 
most people think that to be like a sexy active person it's like you're just always thinking about sex and you need to just like be turned on like that it's not true for the majority of people just honestly like what does that mean to you um one person wrote it makes me feel good because we both understand this idea and we now have better communication about it after reading this book you guys, that's amazing. That's great because no one should feel bad if they have a lower desire than the other partner. There's nothing wrong. It's it's so good that you guys can support each other. Yay. Um, another person wrote, having this knowledge puts things into perspective because so many people go off the sex drive and if it's high or low. And it helps me to understand that for some people, there has to be some kind of intimacy or play before the desire comes, rather than it just showing up out of the blue. There's nothing wrong with me. I just have to figure out what works for me and then create desire. I love that. Thank you. I'm so like, yes, do the work to figure out what works for you. And there's nothing wrong with you. That's amazing. Um, another person. I'm so responsive with occasional spontaneous desire. It was so validating to read about responsive desire because I often felt like something was wrong. Now I feel so much more aligned with myself. I'm normal. Yay. I love that. Thank you for sharing. That's huge. Yes, there's nothing wrong with you. And um, I think Emily Nagoski in this part of the book literally mentions like go tell everyone about this like five different times and that's pretty much how I feel after reading this part three um so yay team um let's move on to the next impatient little monitors I love this I love this concept um the little monitor mind just mind blown um I'm gonna read one little excerpt when you're continually failing to reach a sexual incentive, your little monitor grows frustrated and then angered and eventually despairing. That's why it sometimes feels like an unpleasant internal experience. It's not the desire itself that feels unpleasant. It's your criterion velocity being unsatisfied. In other words, it's not how you feel. It's how you feel about, sorry, it's not how you feel. It's how you feel about how you feel that's huge it's like it's okay to feel frustrated or it's okay to not achieve every little sexual goal that you set for yourself it's about feeling okay about all these emotions um so i wrote for the question is the little monitor grows frustrated when you continually fail to reach a sexual incentive. If your effort to progress ratio is much too large, your little monitor is assessing a goal as unattainable, which means you feel pretty crappy because you're setting these crazy high goals and you're never getting there. You're never getting to that like sexual place where you want to be. So I love that she broke down the three questions to ask yourself when you experience frustration around sexual desire. So number one, is this the right goal for me? Ask yourself that. Do I really need to be going after this? Number two, am I putting in the right kind of effort as well as the right amount? That's, that's big. Like I have this goal, but am I putting in the effort that's going to take me to that goal? And then number three, am I realistic in my experiences about how effortful this goal should be? Huge. So do these questions help you differentiate, differentiate between your desire and your relationship and your feelings about the desire? Include your thoughts about this concept below and what we answered. So one person said, just because I don't feel sexually attracted to my partner at any given moment doesn't mean my love for them ch has changed. Oh, I love that. That's so great. Um, and that's huge, especially if you are looking at other relationships. You're only seeing a very small portion of their relationship and maybe especially with social media that can create this like, this like unrealistic 
portray of what their relationship actually is. So if you're comparing yourself and you're not like googly eyed every moment drooling over your partner, it doesn't mean that you don't love them. It just means that you are a human with varying emotions and that's okay. Um, another person. Yes, the questions are helpful to identify when or if I'm having realistic or unrealistic expectations for myself. If you've never orgasmed, you can't expect to just go into se a sexual encounter and expect to orgasm every time when it hasn't happened yet. Making small goals for yourself, like practicing, being mindful, doing breath work, etc., are going to be more effective. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So don't ever go into a sexual experience thinking, I want this kind of orgasm, I want this, and I want it to be the most mind-blowing thing ever. Because then you're setting yourself up for upset if it doesn't happen, or this like weird egotistical like, I did it! If it does happen, just, just like drop the expectations and ask yourself these questions. And I love that, especially when it comes to experiencing orgasm, because that can be frustrating if you're not doing something and you're not experiencing a physical reaction when it really has a lot to do with more that's going on. Um, another person wrote in, yes, the right kind of effort is so important. And what's right for my partner is different than what's right for me. Amen, sister. That's huge, right? So looking at what your partner needs and what you need to come together is what's going to help your relationship. Bam. I love it. I'm so glad you got that from this. Amazing. Next, we're talking about sustaining desire in monogamous relationships. Um, I also really love this because she talks about different approaches, right? So Number one, first approach is um, Esther Perel. If you've um, ever looked into her work, she's a pretty brilliant person. Um, she's got like awesome TED Talks and podcasts, so go listen to her. Um, but her approach to sustaining desire in a monogamous relationship is more of the higher adrenaline, keep a comfortable distance. So she writes... Um, in desire, we want a bridge to cross. This means intentionally adding distance that creates an edgy instability or uncertainty, a slight and enjoyable dissatisfaction. So it's like creating some distance so that you can like chase each other, right? So that's, that's one approach. And then John Gottman has another approach. Um, and he mentions those who reported that they have they had good sex lives, he writes, consistently mentioned, one, maintaining a close, connected, and trusting friendship, and two, making sex a priority in their lives. In other words, sustaining desire isn't about having a bridge to cross, but building a bridge together. Um, and, you know, the goal of both approaches is to sustain curiosity. Perel suggests that we sustain curiosity about our partner as viewed from a distance. And Gottman suggests that we sustain curiosity about the very nature of pleasure in the context of commitment. Both are clear that passion doesn't happen automatically in the long-term monogamous relationship, but they're also both clear that passion does happen as long as the couple takes deliberate control of the context. And every couple's needs for context are unique. I love that. So she offers two different approaches, and they're both amazing. So I asked, out of curiosity, what strategy most resonates with you for sustaining desire and curiosity in long-term monogamous relationships? So actually, no one said that keeping a comfortable distance with the higher adrenaline approach from Esther Perel was their favorite strategy. And most people said that they prefer a combination of both. And then the next highest amount would be turning towards each other, turning towards each other's desires, the lower adrenaline approach. So majority of people like both approaches and 
for me, I think that works as well because I want to build a bridge with my partner and I want to keep the flavor there too. And that curiosity. Um, so the goal of both approaches is to sustain curiosity. That's the biggest takeaway there. I love it. Amazing. Moving forward, maximizing desire with science. There's different approaches to this and I really love that she broke it down so perfectly. Um, if you're in a relationship, I think that we should all read this. I think this is helpful for everyone. So part one, she talks about, um, she talks about arousing the one ring. So strategy number one for that is raising your heart rate, like literally just doing cardio or exercise to get your blood flowing. Um, this is a general arousal in the body, right? Blood flow to the genitals is one part of arousal. So getting your blood flow pumping will help. Um, and then number two is creating meaningful challenges. So this is like, hey, we're going to try one new thing this month, right? Give yourselves as a couple something important to work toward. Um, it can just be, it can be so little. These you know, these challenges don't have to be like some crazy thing. It can just be like a simple goal to work towards. I really like that. Um, part two, she talks about turning off the offs. So making a plan, be concrete and specific with what, how you can manage the context, right? So um, what will you, where will you be? What will you have done immediately before? What you, will you do immediately after? Um, what sex is worth having and what will you do to create it in your life? Like get very specific and concrete with the details of how you want this to be. This is your life. You, des you design your desire and your needs. Um, number two, anticipate barriers. Don't skip this step, right? Things are going to come up. What's your plan to come back, right? What's the, what's the rebound plan if something, if the context is just completely out the window? What are you going to do next? Anticipate barriers and have a management plan. And then number three is connect it to your identity. Don't just run, be a runner. Don't just want to have sex. Don't just decide to have sex. Try on the identity of a woman who loves having sex. Like in this moment, role play what you want, what you desire. Don't just wait for it to happen, become it. I love that. And I think that's true for anything in life. So try that. <laughs> um, and then part three is desperate measures. So this talks about really changing it up a lot. So number one, she suggests is no sex. Just forget about it and focus on the physical intimacy that you do share, right? I think that's beautiful because it's like, if that is a sore spot in your relationship, like get rid of it and focus on the good things in your relationship, building from there. Um, and then alternate initiation. Each person is in charge of initiating at least once a week. I love this because it just kind of, it's like you're setting up the context and you're setting the foundation for exploration. And it can be a beautiful thing. And it can also make each partner feel really safe. Um, so I love this. And I asked, um, the way the author breaks down different ways to maximize desire within a relationship is pretty amazing. Um, it's such a beautiful quote that she says, this level of mutual acceptance and self-acceptance is itself a specific and vital characteristic of the most exuberantly sex positive context. It requires not simply being aware of how each person's sexuality works, but also accepting and welcoming those sexualities just as they are. It's not about how your sexuality works that matters. It's how you feel about your sexuality, how your partner feels about theirs, and how you both feel about each other's. How does this resonate with you and your experience with desire in relationships? So... What we said here, 
Um, one person wrote, we have different needs and we can recognize that and honor each other's differences and both go out of our way to meet each other's specific needs, even when it's not matching perfectly with a need or desire that we have. That's amazing. Like if you can take one thing away, that's great, right? Like understand that we have different needs and we can support each other and we can help each other and meet each other somewhere. Um, I've never really looked at it this way. This is what another person said. I've always focused more on the other person and how they felt about their sexuality and what they wanted rather than thinking of myself and pinpointing who I am sexually and what I need. Oh, girl, yes, it is time to focus on you because a relationship is with two people. It's two people, at least, minimum, right? This is a monogamous relationship. Um, but it takes two and you both need to participate. So please, please, please keep having these conversations and know that what you desire is important and you need to express that because your partner can't read your mind. No matter how close you are, can't do it. Um, and then one other person wrote, this feels really relevant, especially with all the changes that my body's gone through since we've been together. It's obvious that when I am more self-accepting and or my partner is complimentary or validating of me, my sex life is better. That is beautiful. That is so beautiful. And, um, you know, I'm assuming that this person is a female because our bodies change constantly throughout one month. Our cycles, like within our cycle, your body can completely change, let alone having babies or being with one partner for years and years and years, right? Like that can be a huge source of anxiety. So I'm so glad that you're able to talk about that with your partner and then feel validated and also tell them how they can help you with that internal angst of, oh my gosh, I feel this way about my body. Um, because now when you can communicate what you need, they're better able to help you feel amazing. And that will obviously help your relationship. So ah, I love that. I think that is beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then finally, any insights for this book? How are we feeling? What do we think? Um, and someone wrote, this book has so many OMG, I didn't even know that, or wow, that makes sense moments. I love it. I tell so many people to read this book. I think about my breaks and accelerators all the time and what my context would be. That's amazing. I'm so glad this is helping. Um, and honestly, personally, this book is just so helpful. It helps me in my relationship. It helps me work with people. Um, and really helps me with all of my clients. And I am just so happy to share and read this with these amazing people. Um, so wrapping this up, I wanna give you a couple things that you can try in your home. Um, I am currently in my van, in my home. It's a little bit under construction, so please excuse the mess. But um, two super amazing things that have nothing to do with sex, but will make your sex and your intimacy better with your partner. So number one is eye gazing. Yes, straight up eye gazing. So what I do is I set a timer on my phone or something and put it down five minutes, try five minutes. That's like a really ideal time. If you want to keep going, keep going. But um, setting a timer like sets up the context, it sets up the foundation for you guys to explore within that time. Um, and what you're gonna do is sit up, make sure that the lighting is um, bright enough so that you can really clearly see each other's eyes. Um, you're sitting up nice and tall, make sure you're comfortable and make sure you're eye to eye. So if the shorter person needs to be propped up a little bit, do that. Um, and all you're gonna do is look into each other's eyes and stare and that's it. You can blink. It's not a staring contest, but it is a, this is me, and I want you to see me, and I want to see you for who you are, because the eyes are the windows to the soul, 
in tantric philosophy, this is how you connect with someone's spirit, right? You can talk all you want, but when you can communicate through each other's eyes and through your souls and truly be seen and truly see the person that you're with for who they are, it's magical. Like this is where you can experience things that you can't really explain or even comprehend, but it could take your relationship to like the next level. Um, other helpful hints for when you're eye gazing is put on some relaxing music, uh, preferably with no words so you're not getting distracted and you can just be fully, fully present. Um, but sometimes the music helps with any like awkwardness or, you know, just getting in that mood of like relaxing and breathing in the moment. Um, laugh. It's okay. Try to come back to it. Um, and then the other thing is when you are looking into each other's eyes, typically you want to focus on one point and when you're close, cause you're going to be sitting like cl sit close to each other. Um, if you are sitting cross-legged, ideally knees touching like that close right so it's like about a foot and a half away from each other um but when you notice your eyes like switching from one eye to the other you look into their left eye so you are being received um the left side is the feminine side of the body and that's the thought the side that we receive with so the left eye is going to be receiving that look um, so always look into their left eye if you get like confused. Um, so try eye gazing. It's such a beautiful practice and it can really deepen your intimacy. The other thing is just breathing, breathing with your partner. Um, one practice you can do, maybe even partner this with eye gazing for just a beautiful, um, experience where you're not doing any kind of sexual stimulation you place your hand on your partner's heart like this and then they're going to place their hand on your heart and you're going to bring your hand over theirs on your heart and they're going to bring their hand on top of yours over their heart so like let's pretend this is my partner's hand i'm going to put my hand on top of theirs right so once you guys are both holding each other's hearts and holding each other's hands on each other's hearts, you're going to breathe together. And it just looks like this. <sighs> Try at least three deep breaths together because when you sink your breath, you sink your energy. In yoga philosophy, yogic philosophy, breath is energy. Prana is energy. Prana is breath. It's the same thing. So when you are feeling like you are stuck in crazy thoughts or prepping for doomsday or, you know, just worrying about everything that's going on in the world, guys, it's crazy out there. You can connect with your partner and you can find a home in your heart and in theirs and you can feel that right? You have a physical connection and then you have the energetic connection. And when you breathe together, magical things will happen. So try those two things with your partner. If you don't have a partner, do that with yourself. Um, eye gazing in the mirror is such a beautiful experience because it really, it really changes the way you look at yourself. Um, another thing with eye gazing, you'll start to notice that the deeper you look into their eyes, the physical form will like shift. Like you'll, you kind of like, it becomes out of focus because you're so focused on the pupils that you might notice that they start to look completely different and you might look yourself completely different in the mirror when you like really get into your eyes. So try it out. Let me know what you think. Um, and have fun with it. That's the most important thing. Um, Thank you guys for participating with the survey. Um, we're gonna be really awesome with our deadlines. I'm not gonna postpone the book club meetings anymore. We're gonna do it every month and we're gonna have more books soon. So keep reading, 
part four is going to be bomb and I can't wait to talk about it with you next month. So stay tuned for details and I'm here. If you guys have any other questions or insights or comments or suggestions or book suggestions, let me know. I'm